Endoscopy is one of the most common medical procedures in the world. 15 million endoscopic procedures are performed every year in the U.S. alone. Issue 1. 2.7% of those procedures result in cross-contamination, which often transmit infections such as hepatitis, tuberculosis, salmonella, the superbug, and just about every other infectious disease you can think of. Issue 2. Sedated endoscopy, which involves the patient being sedated while an endoscopic probe is fed through the mouth, can be extremely dangerous because of the risk involved with general anesthesia. 50,000 cardiac complications every single year. The problem. The medical industry is resisting these cost-saving procedures that cut into billions of dollars in revenue. That's called intellectual dishonesty. So I sat down with Dr. Jonathan Aviv, who is the clinical director of the Voice and Swallowing Center at ENT and Allergy Associates. He's also a pioneer in the safe technique of TNE, transnasal esophagoscopy. I sat down with Dr. Aviv and we spoke about simple and safe solutions that can save billions of dollars and most importantly, can save lives. The solutions that we spoke about were so simple and safe, I volunteered to have my throat, esophagus, and even my stomach videotaped from the inside with a transnasal video probe, safely, without anesthesia or any recovery time at all. We're sitting here with Dr. Jonathan Aviv. Good afternoon, Dr. Aviv. Great to see you, David. Thank you so much for coming in. So where, tell us where we are. Where are we? Right now, we're at the Voice and Swallowing Center of ENT and Allergy Associates, the largest single specialty ear, nose, and throat group in the United States. The Voice and Swallowing Center is where we examine people that have voice and swallowing problems. That includes not just hoarseness, not just chronic cough, but people that have acid reflux disease, people that might have cancer. So all diseases of the head and neck, above the collarbone, outside the brain, but including the esophagus. Tell us a little bit about upper endoscopy. So what, what happens is to examine the structures of the throat, the best way to do it is to place a tiny camera it's the size of a piece of cooked spaghetti, so very tiny three millimeters if you want a number. It goes through a numbed up and decongested nose or you can go through the mouth. I'll explain why we go through the nose typically. And with this little camera we're able to see in great detail in a mag view, a magnified view, all the structures of the nose, the sinuses, the tongue, the throat, the top of the esophagus and actually the entire length of the esophagus as well all by going through the nose with the patient wide awake, talking to us, sometimes even eating, while we're examining the structures to see what the problem is. And what's the significance of being wide awake versus sedation? When you go through the mouth, what do you encounter? The tongue is in the mouth, but what's in the tongue? The back of the tongue contains the gag reflex. When you go through the nose, you go behind the gag reflex. So how does that work? When you go through the nose, you're going this way. The gag is over here, right here, basically here. Think of the angle of jaw. You're going behind it. You go behind the gag reflex, you don't need to sedate someone. Right. Where the gag reflex is one of the most powerful reflexes in the body. So to pass an instrument through there, you have to sedate the individual. Now, that's a very simple point, but a huge point. Because as soon as you start sedating an individual, all the risks, all the costs, all the potential complications escalate. You go through the nose, not much happens in terms of risk because you, the patient's awake. You've eliminated the big danger sink, if you will. So do a lot of people have this procedure? Well, it depends what type of procedure. So uh, endoscopies are done all the time. In the ear, nose, and throat world, we do endoscopies of the ear. We do endoscopies of the nose and the sinuses. We do endoscopies of the vocal cords. We also do endoscopies of the esophagus. It's all done transnasal, meaning through the nose, so we avoid the powerful gag reflex. Therefore, the patient can be awake 
and it's very, very safe. Why wouldn't we just keep the patient up and do a T and E rather than a sedated procedure? So that is the thirty billion dollar question. Why do I say thirty billion dollars? Because the facility fee, that is the amount, the facility where the procedure is performed. Right now, we may be doing a transnasal esophagoscopy on you here in this office. So the facility is the office, but you're awake. If we had permission and this was a, a place where we could do a sedated procedure, this facility would get about $3,000 for the sedated procedure. Now it's a big average. Some people say, look, I only get $50. Some people say, I only get $1,000. Some people say, I get $8,000. It varies. This is an average. This is published literature. It's available. It's out there. I've referenced it. So it's, that number is a fairly real number. So 10 million procedures times $3,000, that's $30 billion. And that's every year. And when you have alternatives, say to cut that 30 billion number into 15 billion, so saving the healthcare industry 15 billion a year. Well, what's stopping that? That's your question, what's stopping that? I said this is a $30 billion question. Well, the facility owners have a financial disincentive to offer another procedure that doesn't use the facility. I understand that they have a business to run. At the same time, we know that the information gleaned from a, an awake upper endoscopy or a TNE is the same. It takes much less time. You don't have sedation and therefore it's much safer for the patient. So this is one of these unusual circumstances where you have a procedure addressing one of the most common diseases Americans have, acid reflux disease, which what's the big deal? Untreated can lead to the fastest growing cancer in America, which is esophageal cancer. And the diagnostic procedure, which is fundamental, we're, we're being stopped from doing something very safe, very simple, that is less costly and safer for the patient. And it's safer for the patient any number of ways. First, you don't have the risk of sedation, and we can talk about that. There's a finite risk and what that means. But also, when you're sedated for the day, what happens? You lose a day of work or you lose a day of play. Whatever it is, it's another economic hit. So you're getting it every way. And if I tried to sell you the following, we've been doing this procedure for many years. It's called TNE. Costs a couple of hundred dollars. You could rule out cancer in about five or six minutes. You can treat patients either with food, medication, some combination thereof, and they're on their way in a few minutes. Or, hey, I got a better idea. I'm gonna charge you 3,000 bucks you're gonna be sedated. Oh, and you might get a heart attack, a stroke, or respiratory arrest. Are you in? This is outrageous. This is what's happened. It is, we're like Alice through the looking glass here, okay? And I developed awake endoscopy in 1996. So we've been toiling, really, for 20 years. Is there any end in sight? When I was at Columbia as full-time faculty, I wrote textbooks, published some 60 papers, gave lectures all over the world, no one listened. So you're a pioneer in this area. I am a pioneer, but I'm also a frustrated activist right. because I can't, there's only so much I can do. And then what happened? Tragedy struck. In August of 2014, Joan Rivers, a very well-known comedian, and well known to uh, the acting and popular culture for years had what we're, what we're told was an endoscopy and from what again we're told, what we've read in the newspapers, had complications and succumbed, died subsequent to the procedure. And what do we hear in the lay press? A selfie, the wrong person was in the operating room, all that stuff, I believe that's immaterial. I don't know, and maybe this will come out, I don't know if she was even offered an awake procedure. Maybe she said, I'm not gonna have that thing in my nose, which is an issue which we can get back to. Some people say, knock me out. I don't want anything in my nose. I'd rather die than have something in my nose. 
my answer to that is really. So I think that as people become aware, what do I want out of all this? All I want is when someone says, when the physician says to the patient, you need an endoscopy, the patient says, okay, let, let the doctor say there are alternatives to sedation. In, in, in our, our world, hashtag, are there alternatives? That's what I want to know. That's what the patient should be aware. Let the patient make a decision. Right now, most patients are not aware that there are other options than sedation. You've brought up so many issues. Are you saying that five million upper, endosc uh, upper endoscopic procedures every single year could be performed by this simple t and &E procedure, thereby avoiding patients from being sedated, losing the day of work that you talked about? Are you saying that five million of those patients can have this procedure? The number may be more, the number may be less, but we won't know until on a widespread basis that question is raised. Right now the question is not raised. And it's all about money? I don't know what it's about, okay? To be fair, gastroenterologists, GI physicians, are not trained during their training program to go through the nose. Right. So you can't just hand a physician an instrument and say, go for it. So are we, are we doing more training now? Well, right now, uh, there's, there's some jockeying for position, if you will, between the various industries that make these cameras. And right now, no one is offering a formal training process. When I was at Columbia, we gave training courses at least once a year, sometimes twice a year. We participated in training courses across the country, across the world, really. Uh, if you think about it, in a third world country, you, you may not even have the option of sedation. Well, to use your line, there's probably about 30 billion reasons why there's not a, more training going on. But let's get back to Joan Rivers. Can you? talk to us about, do you have any percentages of sedated procedures that have some sort of complication and how it relates to the Joan Rivers case? Yes, so all this data that I'm talking about is not my, my feeling. This right. is all published data in peer-reviewed journals. What that means is other scientists, other physicians, other PhDs, other experts reviewed this work before it was put in print. Is it foolproof? Absolutely not. But it's some measure of standard. And the numbers are clear. The incidence of what is known as cardiopulmonary unplanned events, heart attack, stroke, respiratory arrest, is 0.5% during sedation for upper endoscopy. So 0.5%, what does that mean? Well, at 10 million, you're talking 50,000 people a year. You're basically filling Giant Stadium or MetLife Stadium. You're filling the stadium, almost, almost. That's a lot of people. Very few of those die, but to, you go in for an endoscopy, you expect to be at dinner that night, and you're in the ICU on a respirator, that's not the greatest. So considering the number of procedures, it's small, but because the number of procedures is so large, even 0.5% is a significant number. And the tragedy is it could be avoided in, in probably a fair number of cases. Or do we really know that now? No, because it hasn't been studied. But has anyone asked the question? Look, has people, anyone asked the question? People die every year. People die every single year. And there's certainly a possibility to keep those people alive. Or what about, so what about some of the other cases in the 50,000? So the, the people that are alive, what do, what do they go through during some of these complications? Well, most of these people thankfully survive. I mean, you, you can survive a stroke. You can survive a respiratory arrest. You can survive a heart attack. People do that all the time. But the, the thing is, could, could we have offered an alternative? And again, when people, a lot of people, they look at the little camera, even though it looks like uh, the spaghetti they had for lunch, they're like, oh, I don't want that in my nose. You say, okay, but understand, at least the conversation takes place. And then someone says, all right, you know what, I'll take the risk. Now, sometimes the risk is unavoidable. For instance, if you have abdominal pain or nausea, we're worried about a mass or a tumor in the stomach or an ulcer 
or you have a bleeding ulcer or something even further down in the top of the small intestine, well, we accept that risk because we're worried about right. something. But there is no alternative. But here, there is an alternative, and all I want is that conversation to happen. Now, sometimes the physician will bring it up, but maybe now the patients will bring it up. Doctor, you say I need an endoscopy. Well, do I have to be knocked out? The look, answer look, is no. Oh, look, maybe the not. patients deserve a bill of rights, a patient's bill of rights to know what the alternatives are. It makes perfectly perfect common sense. Um, so let, let's just move on a little bit. I want to talk about um, another issue that it has been widely publicized now: the issue of cross contamination the issue of endoscopic cross-contamination. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so cross-contamination means a procedure is done with an instrument and that instrument gets cleaned. However, sometimes the instrument is insufficiently cleaned or something happens in the, in the reprocessing and the cleaning of the instrument where some type of infectious inflammatory agent, a bacteria, a virus, a fungus gets transmitted from the instrument being in one patient's body to the next patient. That's called a cross-contamination. Now when does cross-contamination occur? I don't want everyone to freak out that every time they're in a doctor's office that instrument, where was it cleaned and what happened? Well, instruments that are solid tubes, that don't have channels, are generally extremely safe and the way to clean them is very, very straightforward. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about cross-contamination during procedures involving instruments that have channels in them. What's a channel? So if you have, you have a cylinder, within that cylinder you can pass an instrument. So when cameras have channels, when these scopes have channels, that's where the potential danger is because if you want to be very colloquial about it, these little nooks and crannies, bacteria can hide, or infectious inflammatory agents can hide, and it may be tough to clean them. So there are many solutions. One of the solutions that I've been using for years when we do TNE, when we do endoscopic biopsies of the vocal cord, uh, or the tongue base, or the tonsil, what we do is we use a sheath. The sheath itself is a covering. Think of it as a condom. But there's a sheath within a sheath, which is very soft and pliable, so that you can pass an instrument through the channel, take your biopsy. The biopsy instrument is single-use disposable. The sheath is single-use disposable. Nothing ever touches a patient again, because everything gets thrown out, and then you put another sheath on. So nothing touches the patient more than once. So not only are you getting a sterile procedure, you're basically getting a new procedure each time. Exactly, exactly. You, you make the, the scope, because it's basically like using a new scope every time when you use an endo sheath. And it just so happens that with transnasal esophagoscopy, or TNE, they, the, th thankfully industry has manufactured a sheath which is very, very safe, meaning nothing touches the patient. The instruments we use to do biopsies are single use and disposable. So nothing that's used on you is then going to be used on me. So when you when you have a t and &E procedure, not only are you avoiding the whole issue of sedation, you're also avoiding the entire issue if you use a sheath you're avoiding the entire issue of cross-contamination. Right. So it's an extremely safe procedure. Exactly. So, and you, you, you make a very good point. Not, there are a lot of t and &E scope manufacturers who don't use a sheath. In other words, the scope itself has a channel right. and you still have the same potential issues. And obviously what I'm hoping is that industry working together with the infectious control experts we are going to be able to manufacture sheaths for all these different types of cameras, all these different types of scopes, so that it also becomes very, very safe in terms of the cross-contamination issue. But why aren't the sheaths, I mean, in your opinion anyway, why don't we have sheaths generally? Why aren't other doctors using sheaths? Um, I, sheaths are expensive. 
it's an additional cost. Uh, it's an additional procedure that needs to be done. But probably one of the biggest things is, is cost. Because when you have, when you're doing your regular T&E and you're not using a sheath, you're, you're saving a certain number of dollars for uh, procedures very inexpensive to begin with to say to take 25 to 30 percent of that reimbursement to a disposable becomes a, a huge hit on, on revenue. Um, so I believe there are multiple ways around this. There are multiple ways to address this legislatively, working with the government. I mean, if the government said, okay, we can save 15 billion a year, how do we do this? How do we perhaps incentivize people to make this safer for everybody, not only from the cross-contamination perspective, but from the uh, patient safety perspective, not having to use anesthesia? This can be done. It, it's just amazing. In this day and age where we have so much discussion, national discussion on Obamacare, how expensive health care is, just in this one little area, this is just one niche right now, we can save $15 billion to the system and it's not being done. I, I think that education, you alluded to this, I think education will change this. I think patients being aware that there are options will change it. Unless you interview me, unless I'm able to get out in the media, and I do want to thank some, some of our supporters like Dr. Oz, who did have us on and right. is talking about these things, but it's, it's few and far between. Uh, is there anything sexy about saving a life? Is there anything sexy about avoiding cross-contamination? Is there anything sexy about saving $15 billion a year? There's got to be a story there. Well... We, can, we need to clone you. I think that's what we need to do. Let's do this. Can I, can I have a T&E procedure? Yeah, so uh, we'll switch chairs. Right. And you'll tell me your story. Okay. Great. So loud noise. And this is the spray. This is what it looks like coming out. Oh, it tastes delicious. <laughs> Mm. Mm. Very good. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to have you sip water through a straw periodically during the exam. You'll notice I only numbed up your nose, not your throat. And the reason we don't numb up the throat is that we want you to swallow during the exam. As soon as you swallow, the larynx, the vocal cord area, will elevate about an inch. In fact, if you put your finger on your Adam's apple and you swallow, what will oh, yeah. happen? It goes up. Yeah. As soon as that happens, it actually sends a message to the brain to blunt the gag reflex. So we use swallowing water to clear mucus and to blunt the gag reflex. So I'm going to have okay, you great. hold the water, but don't drink it yet. Okay. And now what we're going to do is get the instrument ready. And what are we, what are we looking at on okay. that video screen? So what you're looking at on both of these screens is actually the endoscopic image of first your nose, then your throat, and then your entire Tim's esophagus. Tim's going to get to see my nose and throat? Everything. I can't Everything. believe it. He's going to get up close and personal. Oh my gosh. Oh, so, <laughs> so this is, the sheath is placed. Get ready, placed. Tim. Right, so where's the sheath? The sheath has been placed already on the instrument. Wow. So I'll demonstrate what that is. It fits snug right on there. You can't even tell. It's very tiny. And then what you're seeing is these two catheters. What they do is give a little air. So you're going to hear, you hear that noise, right? And when I press down, and here you'll feel it on your cheek. Right. You feel that feel little bit of air? Sure. So just like swallowing water, blunts the gag reflex and initiates what we call peristalsis, meaning the esophagus has a natural movement. When you give a little pulse of air, that also opens up the esophagus and allows the esophagus to move so you can see what's going on. Normally, the esophagus is a flat muscular tube. When you eat, it opens up. When you give a little air, it opens up. When you give some water, it opens up. Okay. So that's what we're doing here. Gotcha. 
And then what you can see is that we can actually move the tip of the light here. Remember ET's finger? Wow. Right. And that's so, going to go in my, that's going to navigate through my nose. Exactly. And wow. I'm able to control it with, with the control body over here. Holy cow. And that, that's the camera at the tip? This is, this is the camera. The camera's at the tip. You can see we're illuminating the uh, control body here and the light source. And it's actually the incredible image. So, and you see, this is a sheath. It's all covered. This instrument is actually never going to touch you. Just the sheath just is. Just the sheath. And when we're done, I'll demonstrate. It's a we'll new just, procedure. We'll take the sheath off, and that'll be that. Incredible. The shot. Wow. Okay, so just turn to me a little bit. Okay. Uh, head a little more to the midline. That's it. Perfect. Just look over my left shoulder. You're perfect that way. That's it. You're doing great. Excellent. And just have one sip of water. Okay. Now what I want you to do is say E. E. And after you say E, give me a little sniff. E. Perfect. Okay. Everything looks great there. Don't hold your breath. Okay. Now what I'd like you to do is take four consecutive sips of water through the straw. I'll tell you when and go ahead. That's it. Two more. Ah, perfect. All right, we're in the esophagus. You did great. Take another sip, please. Beautiful. And another sip. There's just a little mucus there. And another sip. I'm just there's just a huge blob of mucus that I'm trying to get off here. Sorry. Okay. So I'm going to ask you again to take four consecutive sips. That's it. Beautiful. And just two more. All right, we're in the esophagus. We have an incredible view. That's it. You don't have to sit right now. Are you okay? Yep. All right, so what you're seeing, the pulsations here are the arch of the aorta, which is the big blood vessel in the body. And here, we're right, that salmon-colored tissue is the bottom of the esophagus. So everything, everything looks great. Everything looks great. Are you okay? Yep. All right. So what I want you to do is we're going to go into the stomach. So what I'd like you to do is just take three consecutive sips and we'll float right into the stomach and then we're almost done. That's it. You're doing great. I'm looking for the espresso. Okay, so there's a little food in here, but that's okay. We actually had a very good look at the entire system here. And we're almost done. Just take one more sip. Beautiful. That's it. To the vocal cords again, say E. E. Beautiful. E. That's it. Tim. You did, you did great. That's it. I can't believe it. And what I'm going to do now is... But, but let's yeah. wait. So what we just did avoided sedation, uh, a whole group of, you know, one guy uh, sedating me, the other one, a whole thing, me being put out, hours, waking up, hopefully, and th that w missing a day of work. Right. So, exactly. So the, the I mean, I can't even believe this. The, I mean... The components are, if you really want to... It takes about two or three minutes to put in an IV, right? The intravenous line. During that time, the procedure's done. Right? Right. Right. And I'll, we'll review it, but the cross-contamination issue, right? Okay. So how do, we, how do we reprocess this camera? I take out the catheters from the housing. 
There's this little lever here. I put it like that. Wow. It's a new scope. It slides off. Nothing is touched. Nothing is ever going to... This didn't touch you. I fold it up. And I throw it out. Wow. And that's it. That's it. Now I do wipe down the scope, etc., etc., but... That's incredible. Right, that was thanks, great. Man. That was you're great. a great patient. And you, and Thank you just you. ate. Wow. You're, you're well, good. Yeah.